Having discussed how to realize switches using semiconductor devices and to uh, de implement things such as single quadrant or two quadrant switches in a switching converter, we're now in a position to discuss what, what is known as the discontinuous conduction mode. And chapter five uh, covers the first the origin of the discontinuous conduction mode and then how to solve it and we'll do some examples of solving Bach and Boost converters uh, that operate in this discontinuous conduction mode. The converters that we've discussed so far in this course operate in what is called the continuous conduction mode. Uh, by contrast to the mode of operation we're going to discuss uh, now. Uh, the discontinuous conduction mode occurs because there is a ripple in the current or voltage waveform that is applied to one or more of the switches inside the converter and this ripple is larger than the DC component uh, and as a result the the current or the voltage attempts to reverse through the switch now if we realize the switch to be a unidirectional switch and we try then to reverse the polarity uh, the switch doesn't behave in the way uh, that it was intended and so it will switch on or off at a time that does not coincide with the driver signal switching and uh, so we get additional uh, intervals or sub-intervals within the switching period uh, as a result and this completely changes the characteristics of the converter. The most traditional um, discontinuous mode operation occurs because the inductor current ripple is greater than the DC component of current and this causes the current through the switches to try to reverse direction. Uh, the diode won't allow it, the diode will turn off instead and uh, we get a third period during the uh, switching period and this changes the characteristics of the converter uh, substantially. So uh, uh, when the discontinuous mode happens what we're going to find is that the output voltage now becomes load dependent. In continuous mode, say for a buck converter, the output voltage is the duty cycle times the input voltage. Any dependence on load is small and only comes from loss, the effects of losses in the converters. Uh, in the discontinuous mode, though, we have a first order dependence of the output voltage on the load current. Uh, so the properties of the converter change drastically. We then, all of a sudden, we have a high output impedance. We're going to find uh, that or it, it turns out that the dynamics of the converter that we're going to discuss uh, in several weeks, those dynamics change very substantially and in fact they're simpler in discontinuous mode. Um, we also find that when you remove the load the discontinuous mode causes the output voltage to not be controllable and it can do bad things so we have to account for that. Some converters are designed on purpose to always work in discontinuous mode. One of the good things about it is that the current goes to zero before the end of the switching period, the diode turns off, and then there's no reverse recovery when the MOSFET is next turned on. So there can be less switching loss. But on the other hand, there are higher peak currents, and so we can get more conduction loss, and there's a trade-off then. Uh, even if we don't intentionally design a converter to work in this mode, um, many converters will operate in the discontinuous mode at low output power and so we have to be able to analyze and know what's going to happen then at those operating points. So uh, what we're going to do in this lecture is discuss the origins of the mode and find the mode boundaries, the conditions under which we operate in continuous or discontinuous mode. And then in the next several lectures, we will analyze converters to find their output voltages and other things uh, when they operate in the discontinuous mode. So here's an example. We have a, a basic buck converter, and we've realized the switches with uh, conventional uh, single quadrant switches of a transistor and a diode. Um, here is what the inductor current waveform looks like in the continuous mode and it's the waveform we've been drawing all along this uh, in this class. So it has a DC component that we're labeling capital I, plus it has some switching ripple uh, that has a peak magnitude of delta I. Okay, we previously analyzed this circuit and we know how to calculate capital I and delta I now. 
Um, here are the expressions. So the DC component, capital I, is the load current, V over R. And delta I, the, the uh, peak to average ripple, is the slope times the time, which we can write in terms of VG like this. Uh, and the ripple depends on the duty cycle, VG, the inductance, and the switching period. Okay, the interesting thing about this is that the DC component depends on the load resistance, or on the, the current that the load decides to draw, but the ripple doesn't. The ripple depends on all kinds of things, but the one thing it doesn't depend on is the load resistance or the load current. So what happens if we, say, increase the value of R, or our load all of a sudden decides it doesn't need as much current? Well, that will make the DC component, capital I, go down, but it won't change the uh, ripple. Now, what's important here is actually the effect of that on the diode. So when the diode is on, it conducts the inductor current, and the diode current waveform looks like this. So when the diode is on, it has the same capital I plus the ripple, and the minimum diode current happens right there at the end of the switching period. And that minimum value is the DC component of current minus the ripple. Okay, so the diode current has to stay positive for the diode to work. And uh, when we account for the ripple, the, the uh, minimum diode current is actually less than capital I. So let's consider increasing the value of R to the point where the ripple equals capital I, actually we reduce capital I so it's equal to the ripple, then the inductor current looks like this, and the diode current follows the inductor current for the second half of the period. So you can see that the diode current starts out at capital I plus delta I, and it ends at capital I minus delta I, which for this particular load current is equal to um, zero. Okay, what happens if we increase the load resistance even more? Well, here is that case. DC component of lo load current and inductor current, capital I, is now less than delta I. So even though the average current and the load current are positive, they're less than delta I, and so the diode current and inductor current go to zero before the end of the switching period. Okay, once that happens, the diode will turn off and it will not allow the inductor current to continue uh, in the same direction and go negative. So we get a third interval now. Uh, this, uh, from the point the diode turns off until the end of the switching period where uh, the diode and the MOSFET are off and the inductor current just sits at zero current. So now our switching period is divided into three intervals. There's the D1 interval, the first interval, which we're also going to call DTS. It's the D is the, the MOSFET duty cycle, and D1 is the duty cycle of the first interval, and they're the same here. Uh, we have a D2 interval now when the diode conducts, and we have a D3 interval when nobody conducts. So this is the discontinuous mode um, of operation. And this extra interval changes all the equations of the converter. So first of all, we need to be able to write the equations of the mode boundary, and we now we have a um, we have a way to do that. That the mode boundary happens when delta i is equal to the DC component capital I. Okay. Uh, and in fact, the conditions then are that uh, we're in DCM or discontinuous mode when when capital I is less than delta I. Now, at the boundary, the continuous mode equations are still valid, so we can plug the continuous mode equations that we had for capital I and delta I into these equations to find the boundary. So here's here's the expression for capital I in terms of VG. Here's the expression for the delta I. And uh, so we can plug them into this, and we can solve. So what, the VGs cancel out. Uh, we can move the 2L and TS over to the left-hand side and uh, cancel the Ds, it looks like, and we'll get this expression. 
So this is the expression or the condition for operation in the discontinuous mode. Okay, the quantity on the left hand side is a function of element values in the switching period. Uh, it's traditional to call this quantity K. And so in the power electronics business, we generally call capital K is 2L over RTS. And this 2L over RTS factor keeps coming up in many of our equations over and over from here on. Um, the right hand side is the critical value of K at the boundary between modes. So we call that K crit. Uh, so the right hand side is a function of duty cycle. It will vary with duty cycle. Um, but when K is equal to K crit, then we're at the mode boundary. And if K is less than K crit, then we operate in the discontinuous conduction mode. For the buck converter, we, we find here that k crit is equal to d prime. For different converters, they'll have k crit will be a different function of duty cycle, but in general, we can write this expression uh, for the mode boundary in some equation of the form k less than k crit of d for discontinuous mode. So here's a plot of that. Um, k crit. for the buck converter is 1 minus d, or d prime. So here's a plot of k crit versus d. So k crit is 1 at d of 0, k crit is 0 at d of 1, and it looks like that. Okay, so we compare that to k. So suppose k is less than 1. But the, the maximum value of k crit is 1, so if k is less than 1, say some value like here, then we'll be in discontinuous mode over this range where k is less than k crit. And then at higher duty cycles over this range we'll be in continuous mode. On the right side here is another example where k is bigger than 1. And in that case k is always greater than k crit. So we're always in continuous mode then for the different converters, buck boost and buck boost, it, with their k crit expressions uh, labeled. So k crit for the buck is d prime. We're going to show uh, in an upcoming lecture that k crit for the boost is d times d prime squared. And uh, on the homework, you're going to work out for the buck boost that k crit is d prime squared. Um, for the buck, the maximum value of k crit for any d between 0 and 1 is 1. So if k is greater than 1, then we're always in continuous mode. But if k is less than 1, then we have to worry about discontinuous mode. For the boost, it, this maximum value turns out to be 4 27ths. We'll discuss that. Uh, it's an interesting number that comes out of nature here. Uh, the, bo the boost is less likely to run in discontinuous mode. But if k is smaller than 4 27ths, then it can. Uh, for the buck boost, the maximum value of k crit is 1. So again, with k less than 1, we may run in discontinuous mode. OK, uh, so that's the mode boundary. In the next lecture, we're going to solve for the output voltage.